Hi, my name is Gabrielle Luke, and I have the privilege of serving as the chairperson um, for the MLK um, Celebration Planning Committee. And so the first thing that I'd like to do is invite folks, please feel free to move up closer to the stage. It's the joys of higher education. We always have the back rows filled first, and no one wants to get too close. But um, do feel free to move up if you'd like to get a little closer to our panel. In introducing, I, I really want to, I, I'm just gonna be kicking it off and handing it off to our STEAM team, but as folks get a bit organized, um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. And there are a few people that we really do wanna point out in terms of our gratitude. Um, one is a special thanks to Kim Hanchett of the Dickey Center and Elise Smith, um, class of 13, who serves as the intern in our office. Um, both of them did a lot of the research over at Rauner that enabled us to assemble this fine panel of speakers, which we're very excited to hear about. Um, I also want to thank Lauren Frank from Conferences and Special Events, who did a lot of the logistics for this event, along with other members of our logistics committee. Um, as we begin the MLK celebration each year, this year is particularly poignant in that we are going to be celebrating this spring Dr. King's 50th anniversary of his visit here to Dartmouth. And um, there is a lovely plaque commemorating that over in Dartmouth Hall. And his speech towards freedom um, was a very powerful, moving piece for our community. Um, and we are very honored here to have a group of folks who actually took steps to help move our country towards greater freedom for our community. And so with that being said, I would like to turn it over to Thank Professor you. Anthony. Hello and welcome. Uh, and I would encourage people as you finish eating, if you want to come up, um, we're going to be telling stories up here. Our guests are going to be telling stories and you're going to want to hear them. I'm uh, Denise Anthony. I'm uh, in the sociology department and I'm also the director of the Institute for Security, Technology and Society here at Dartmouth. And I am really thrilled to have been asked to um, moderate the panel today. Um, as a sociologist, sociologists study social movements um, quite a lot, and so I have read many books about Freedom Summer and the Civil Rights Movement and the role of not only the leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Diane Nash, who was here and visited Dartmouth last year and many others, but if you don't mind, ordinary people. <laughs> and, and the message for that is that we, in some ways, we're all ordinary people. And so, you know, we're gonna hear from people who, who were ordinary people, who, who did something extraordinary themselves and for our country. And it's, um, so I'm thrilled to be here and so glad you're here. At the MLK keynote the other night, um, with Coach Boone's talk, which was very fun and inspiring, um, but before that talk, the president of the African American Society, Joan Leslie, I'm just, I don't know Joan, so I wanna make sure I have her name right, she gave a great speech talking about, talking to students here to say, right, reminding us of something that's now become common, you know, how to get out of your comfort zone right, how to think about interacting with people who may be different from you and what, why that might change who you are and your experience and why that's important to do. These four gentlemen are gonna tell us about how they got out of their comfort zone of Hanover, New Hampshire and Dartmouth College. Um, and so what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna briefly introduce each of them they're gonna take about five minutes each to tell us how they got from Hanover to Mississippi or Alabama during Freedom Summer. Um, and then they're gonna spend a few minutes asking each other questions because remarkably, they didn't know each other before this, even though they were all here at the same time and, and experience, you know, all uh, went to um, the South during Freedom Summer. And, um, and then we're gonna open it up to you. And um, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, so we'll wanna have an interactive session. So with that, I'm going to start on the far left where we have Paul Stetzer, who is a Dartmouth 67. Um, and Paul was involved in the civil rights movement and then also movements 
since then, the anti-poverty movement, the anti-war movement, environmental movement, gay rights movements. Um, he's worked primarily in education, um, the preschool anti-poverty program called Get Set. Um, he has been an organizer of labor, um, an environmental educator at the Schuylkill Valley Nature Center, and teacher of environmental science at the Germantown Friends School, I believe both in Philadelphia or in the Philadelphia area. And he is now becoming a documentary photographer and is working on a project entitled Democracy is Coming. Next we have William Burton, who's Dartmouth 65, um, who participated in the voter right registration work in the Mississippi Summer Project and has been actively involved in politics since that time. Uh, he was town supervisor of Ossining, is that how you say it? Ossining, New York, from in the 90s, much of the 90s, 91 to 97. Uh, and in 2005, he was elected to the Westchester County Legislature. Outside of politics, he has um, had a career working and owning businesses in publishing and printing in New York City. Next, we have Roger Daly, Dartmouth, 1967, who is an ordained minister at, in the United Church of Christ and has been a pastoral minister for 41 years. He received his uh, Master of Divinity from Gordon-Conwell Theological School and his Master um, of Education in Clinical Psychology from the University of New Hampshire. Um, Father Daly joined the Civil Rights Movement as a volunteer worker in the SNCC, in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in, in Mississippi and Alabama, um, and has a lot of great stories about that. And then to my left, immediate left, is Dirk DeRuz, who's a Dartmouth 68. Um, he what was I going to say there? I'm sorry. Um, he, he spent much of his time in the freshman year. That's what I think I was thinking. It was your yeah, sophomore year he before here. he even came to Hanover. So he didn't go directly from Hanover in Mississippi um, working on voter re registration. Um, after graduating from Dartmouth, he earned his JD at Indiana University. Um, and he went on to active duty in the Army. Um, he was a ROTC. ROTC here at Dartmouth during this time. Um, he is currently a partner in the Denver office of the international law firm of Fagri, Baker, and Daniels, um, and has extensive courtroom experience at the state and federal level. So a really interesting and diverse group of alumni. So um, I think we're gonna start by asking Paul if you would, if you would begin and give us a little bit about that point in time and how you got to the work you did in Mississippi. In Mississippi, yes. Can, can you hear me? Good. It's interesting that you said that we got out of our comfort zone because for me going to Mississippi was getting into my comfort zone. One of the ways that we got assembled was somebody discovered a 1965 article by the head of the Dartmouth Christian Union saying, naming some of us and, and talking a little bit about what we'd done. And they said that even one, one even came from the very wealthy suburbs of Philadelphia called the Main Line. That was me. And I had been raised in a very uh, privileged and narrow background and, and with, with parents who were fairly racist. And at some point, a love interest how often does that happen? A love interest persuaded me that, huh, it's okay to think about civil rights. And then there was the Martin Luther King, we have a dream speech, the March on Washington in 1963. And I think the assassination of Kennedy in that fall and then later doing some um, tutoring of poor inner city kids in Philadelphia in the summer of 64, began to change my mind considerably. And then, and here's a real difference in time, then came out a mimeograph sheet with a misspelled word at inviting Dartmouth students to go to Mississippi to help Nagoos register to vote. Well, mimeograph sheets were pretty, you, you couldn't change them. 
and they were expensive, so it went out that way. And we showed up. A bunch of us volunteered, and we showed up at the, at the Dartmouth Christian Union, and we were told a little bit about what to expect, and we were given nonviolent training, and this was really important. What I didn't remember, but I got from the article, was that we were selected based on how well we did with our nonviolent training. <laughs> Who knew that there was a selection process? But um, then four of us, Bill reminded me of this, four of us traveled in a, in a uh, station wagon to Mississippi, and the first day that we got there, we, we landed in Jackson, Mississippi. There was a, a council of federated organizations house there. A bunch of people were all sleeping on the floor, and there's the bed. And I said, can I have the bed? And they said, sure. See those holes there? Yeah. That's where the shotgun came through last week. I said, nah, it's not going to happen tonight. And then we were sent to Philadelphia, Mississippi. Coming from Philadelphia, I thought, this is cool, but that's the town from which Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney had been taken and lynched. And that happened only a few, their, their bodies were discovered only a few weeks before we got there. The lynching happened, I think, in June of 64, and we're now talking about October of 64. What was amazing was being able to, to go out day after day and talk to people in the streets. What was amazing was, being, was, being, was going with several people to rural black churches to, to try to organize people to register to vote, but not really to register to vote because people were not, black people were not allowed to register to vote. So we were registering them for a fictitious um, group called the, not quite fictitious, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. What was amazing was hearing people who'd been civil rights workers and black people who'd been trying to register to vote singing in the jail. There, was, there were so many, and I realized I was home. So I, I left the uncomfortable place of Hanover, New Hampshire to go to the comfort of Mississippi for a fairly short time. But I think that's enough for me. Thank you. Okay. Well, Paul, sir. There's been reference made to, to Mississippi Freedom Summit, and, and perhaps we should tell you what this was. This was an organizing tactic of SNCC and several of the other organizations at the time to try to find some relevant way to get people, and Mississippi was selected because a lot of the leadership came from Mississippi, to get them involved in a process which would lead to the ability to actually register and actually to vote in real elections. And why this happened in 1964 was because the previous year, the Civil Rights Act of 1963 had been signed by President Johnson as a, an effective memorial to John F. Kennedy. So having this tool, and having the willingness of a, of a federal administration to go out and enforce it um, meant that people like the leadership in, in SNCC and COFO and other groups could say, all right, here's an opportunity to go and do something. You may be up there in New Hampshire, but if you'd like to take the summer off and come and help us. I didn't because I had a summer job and I needed to make the money. And my, my Parents were, as, as Paul was so kind enough to put it about his, um, quiet racists. Well, mine weren't particularly quiet about it. Their idea of Jews and blacks was not something that we had any point in discussing here, but it wasn't particularly nice. And I was in substantial rebellion about that and had been since I was in elementary school. Um, and so when the opportunity came up to go to Washington in 1963 on the march, I didn't go. I had a summer job. When things came along in 1964, um, in the winter, I didn't go. Uh, but when this came up, after Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman had been dug out of that dam, something just clicked, and I had to do something. So I was the manager of the soccer team at that point. I went to the coach, Whitey Burnham, and said, Whitey, I'm going to leave for three weeks. And he said, we're in a drive to become Ivy League champions, and if we do that, we can go to the NCAAs. You've got to stay. And I said, no, thank you, and I left figuring that I simply burned every possible bridge I would have. Um, and we went down. Uh, uh, George Kobfleisch, who was the head of the DCU, had gotten us a, a college car. So four white kids, three, three white kids and one black kid, um, Richard Joseph, who used to teach, uh, uh, I think, here for a while, um, went to Mississippi with um, New Hampshire license plate on a car. This was probably not the smartest thing we've ever done, 
But we were in fact surrounded, as it turned out, by a large number of federal agents. We didn't know it at the time, but because of the lynching of, of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, they were all over the place. The feds were all over the place. But our job, as Paul said, was going door to door, trying to register people for a fictitious election, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic election, because you couldn't really get into the real electoral process. And the opportunity to do that just took me out of my comfort zone, which was, which was this place, and put me into a place I'd never been to before with people I had no idea that they lived the way they lived, and discovered not only the music in the churches, but the, the camaraderie of working with people on an organized political level to make something happen. Now, it wasn't a legitimate election, it wasn't any of those things, but it was a start. And if there's anything that any of the four of us have in common is that that first time when we started was the most exciting, the most scary, and the most impactful thing in our lives. I'm speaking for myself, but I think we, we found at dinner the other night that there, there was always a place when you start. And if you, if you take anything away from here today, it's the realization that it's not what you do, it's that you start doing it. Um, that was everything to me. And I was therefore uh, very grateful to have this opportunity, and I, I think uh, Roger and Kirk are going to expand on this as well. Uh, my, I, I concur with uh, Paul. Uh, Dartmouth was not a comfort, comfortable place for me. Um, I had experienced the death of my father the year before I came as a freshman, and um, uh, actually at the beginning of my sophomore year, I also uh, discovered beer. <laughs> uh, and uh, had avoided it ever, up until that point. Anyway, but a number of things at that particular point in my life conspired to create a lot of confusion for me. And, and so I actually approached the, the beginning of October of my sophomore year with a determination to somehow find meaning in my life uh, that I couldn't find on campus. It was here, but I couldn't find it. And so what I did basically was to ch make a choice to withdraw from uh, Dartmouth, uh, which I did in the middle of October. And um, there are a number of things that were sort of seeds for me. This is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's presence here on this campus. It's also the 50th anniversary of a week that Martin Luther King spent at the boarding school I went to in Massachusetts, uh, in which uh, he uh, uh, basically finished my sentences. Uh, I learned from him in those brief moments that, uh, that there was a way to, uh, to act uh, in, a, in a loving way on the basis of the things that outraged you or that were, uh, were um, intuitively uh, um, wrong, hurtful, destructive. Uh, and um, I had sort of become known as a person who stood up next to a, a small person when a bigger person was picking on him. Uh, and uh, so I left here, and part of that was consulting with a, a man who had become really my mentor, uh, in a, a, a replacement in many ways, of, in important ways, of my father. And uh, uh, he reminded me of some things that he knew about me that led that. That, that moved me toward the civil rights movement. It certainly was conspicuous to me. Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney had been murdered. I was aware of that. Uh, the shenanigans of the trial, the, the mock mockery of the trials and, and the process in Mississippi was taking place. That was all outrageous to me. And uh, this headmaster of the school I went to said, on your way from Hanover to New Jersey, where you grew up, where you're going home, stop at Yale University and speak with William Sloan Coffin, who was, who was the chaplain of Yale. William Sloan Coffin was the arch radical of the day, and uh, 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 died the arch radical of his day when, when he died, uh, years and years later. And between uh, New Haven and Gladstone, New Jersey, where I grew up, uh, I uh, basically made a commitment to the civil rights movement and I also was equipped with, uh, with, a, with a, a name and a contact at Princeton, New Jersey, which was near where I, where I lived, uh, and became connected then to the system of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. At the beginning of the year, 
uh, right after Christmas, I got on a bus from uh, the Port Authority in New York and ended up in Jackson, Mississippi. Was taken uh, uh, from Jackson to, I can't remember the name of the town, for five days of, of, of tr orientation and training in nonviolent protest. I should have learned then that my, the training meant I, my, my experience was going to be a little different. But I went from there to a place I'd never heard of, which was Selma, Alabama, uh, at the beginning of January, where I was for two years. I mean, for, excuse me, for two months. And the whole focus was very different there. The goal was for us to, uh, to uh, be arrested, to be beaten, to be abused, so that the media could uh, make it uh, possible for the country to be as outraged as many others were. And uh, I sort of have used the term uh, uh, sort of like cannon fodder. <laughs> In many ways I was, uh, because I, I and another white uh, student actually from Dartmouth also, named uh, Johannes Lutkus, uh, were generally the first to be arrested and thrown into jail. Uh, and that happened four different times. Uh, I was really an observer, and one day I was observing a registration in the courthouse, county courthouse across the street, and I, I was cold cocked by a man and beaten. And after that, I became an angry participant in the movement. Uh, and. Um, uh, basically, uh, at, at that particular point, uh, um, I, I, I became very much involved and uh, wholehearted about it. There are so many elements to me that are, 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 are significant about my experience there that have been uh, um, instructive in the journey, as crooked as uh, has been. Covered beer, that was the year it was invented, wasn't it, actually? That, that was the year it was imported at Molson's, coming across the border to Hanover. In the summer of 1964, I was working on the Standing Rock Sioux Indian Reservation in a real remote area. Um, no roads or anything. It was cool. And uh, we used to go sometimes, if I was lucky, on Saturdays into the agency headquarters, a place called Fort Yates, and we would... Uh, uh, get supplies for the camp and one Saturday I was in this Fort Yates and there were some Indian kids some guys that I knew a little bit and uh, So I was talking to him about going down to the Joe D bar in McLaughlin, South Dakota and kind of you know also discovering beer and We had done that in the past and these Indian kids were talking about Mississippi freedom summer they were talking about events in the South where people were deprived of their rights and their dignity and their ability to vote. And um, I was embarrassed. No, I wasn't embarrassed. I was ashamed. Um, and, you know, pardon me if I'm a little, if there's a little emotion and passion in this, but it was a very emotional and passionate time. And I haven't really thought about it for a long time. Um, I think of these Sioux Indian guys whose family and, and ancestors had been imprisoned on this reservation and starved and their famous leader Sitting Bull was murdered there and they're talking to me about America. Hmm? So I thought about it a little bit and told them the next time I saw them, I'm going to go down south. What that involved I didn't really know but I knew I was going. And I thought, uh, well, I have to work this out with the college. Hey, that was no problem, by the way. They were, or they were working with SNCC. I called them from one of those phone booths where on one part of the phone booth you can uh, make a call, and the other part you close it off, and for a quarter you could take your picture. It was like the only phone on the reservation. Anyway, so I called them up, and they said, great, you know, with SNCC and everything. I hadn't even, you know, registered yet. This is the summer in 1964, and then of course I had to talk to my dad, and I thought, well, in this best of all possible worlds, that won't really be a problem. And uh, he was pretty direct, and he said, well, you'll be going to college, young man. You're not going to go to Mississippi or down south. So I gave his opinion, as most 18-year-olds would do, the weight to which it was entitled, and the next thing I knew, I was on a bus to Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> and uh, see, I thought this was all like a misunderstanding that if you could just sit down and talk to people, and I thought that's what we were supposed to do. You'd explain to people why this, you know, you can't, people get to vote, come on, you can't, you can't take rights away, so there's some kind of misunderstanding. And, uh, and then I got to Birmingham, 
And we went through this nonviolence training where you lay down on the floor and protect anything you think is important, and people kick the hell out of you. Or they'll, you sat in chairs like this around a table, and you'd be pushed on the floor and insulted. And I thought, you know, this isn't going to be quite what I thought it was going to be. They told us, uh, like, you know, when you're there, don't go out and get in a police car at night. Be careful about this. Be careful about that. Some areas of the South, you'll be, a, you know, uh, you'll be a little freer to do certain things. Other areas are really bad. And, of course, the worst place is Neshoba County, Mississippi, and the county seat of Philadelphia. And the next thing I knew, I was on a bus to Neshoba County, Mississippi, to Philadelphia. Uh, what we were to do was to go, basically, um, there were just four or five of us. I don't know, what was this, like July something? Neshoba, I expected to meet monsters. I mean, if you don't know, they were, if they, they were killing people there. I mean, they killed people who came down just to talk about these issues. And uh, they killed blacks and whites when they were looking for the bodies of the three murdered civil rights workers who were killed in that town. They found eight other bodies of blacks who had just disappeared. Um, and so I expected monsters when I got there um, because we were supposed to go door to door and try to register people to vote. Well, the first shock that I got is I did not meet monsters. This was a little dirt road, red dust, you know, out, out in the boondocks, country town, not a lot different than the ones that I knew from Iowa and Nebraska. And these people reminded me of the people, the farmers that I'd grown up with. They talked a little different. I did meet a monster eventually. Maybe we'll come to that. But what I did is walk door to door by myself every day, trying to talk to people and convince them that they should exercise their rights, um, that they should vote. Uh, and it was, I say there were just four or five of us in this little shack. The FBI was there just down the street at like some cheesy motel, the Wagon Wheel Motel, and, or something like that. And uh, it was very interesting that I didn't meet that initial hostility. It, it, the town was divided. It was tense. And uh, if you want to get a sense of what it was like, go dig up an old Gene Hackman movie called Mississippi Burning and watch that movie. Uh, it's, of course, a movie, and it's fictionalized, but it's basically true. And when I last watched it, my wife gave it to me for Christmas. Um, it raised my blood pressure and my heart rate, and I think it will yours, too, if you can imagine yourself in that setting. Um, at first, things were good, and I tried to do what I was supposed to do. I say luck is always possible, but trouble is for certain. And trouble came, and when it eventually came, it came big time. all um, what we talked about doing now was giving you the opportunity to ask each other a few questions about that time your experience how it affected you over the coming years of your life um, and so I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that a little bit and and then we're going to open it up to you to ask questions and for you to share, um, to, to ask uh, these incredible speakers to share. Would, would any of you We're good. Like to we start? start? You start. You were the last speaker. Go ahead. No, let's go back. Let's, let's just run. I mean, I, my question is a pretty straightforward one, <laughs> which we all have asked ourselves a lot. Well, go ahead and ask it then. Well, here it is. Why did this make any difference? Did it make any difference? What the hell were we doing there? If Those it, are several questions. Yeah. They are. <laughs> Lawyers get to ask compound questions. You're the witness, so no, answer no, no, the no, question. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> if it made a difference, it, it certainly wasn't in the near term. Um, I don't know how many people that I spoke to ultimately went out and voted in this, in this Mississippi Freedom election. I have no idea. Because two weeks after we were there, I was back in Hanover. Um, the soccer team had won all three games. We were, we were uh, two days away from the Yale game, which we then won. And all of a sudden, we were the team to beat for the Ivy League championship, which we won. And we went to the NCAAs. And Whitey Burnham got me to go to the Rotary Club and talk about my experience. I thought he would have me lynched. But I thought the team <laughs> would lynch me for leaving. But no, I actually had a good assistant manager. And everything worked out well. But there was no direct impact. And there never is. But it's the longer term impact on three groups. Um, yourself personally, because you've suddenly had 
the opportunity to do this and, and you see the larger scene. The people who you worked with had some sense that there was somebody from the outside world who came and came in there. And the third group that it impacted on was the, the larger immediate family that you have. Not only my parents, who were on the one hand scandalized, but on the other hand, in church they were amazingly pleased. And they, and they talked about what I had done in a positive way. Not saying this, this, this crazy son of ours went off and did something, but they would, they would talk about it in a positive way. And the same thing with the, with the friends I had back in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They, there was a, a buzz somehow that, that he'd gone and done something that was worthwhile. And that develops. It's like tossing the stone in the pond. So there is, a, there is an impact that you have. You just don't see it. But you have to, but, but when you've lived it, and then, and then you go on further to whatever you're going to do, it's the opportunity you've had to learn something. And whatever you go and do, whether you become an investment banker or a teacher or a lawyer or, God help you, a politician, um, it's, it's there in you. And, um, Unless you bury it so deeply that, that it never comes out again, it always informs who you are. And, and that's, uh, that's why I'm so grateful I've had this opportunity. That, that when, when George put this flyer out, I did, I'd forgotten about the misspelling, but you were right. That was, that was pretty egregious. Um, the, if I hadn't seen that, if I hadn't been drawn into this, I, I, I think my life would have been a very different one. Uh, and I'm not all the sure it would have been a better one. But I think there's a slightly different answer to that, too, and that is, it resulted in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. There was a concrete and direct result of what we did. And the part of the reason why I, I feel very confident in saying that is that we had the, the wonderful opportunity and took it of uh, participating in a movement, a very well-developed movement. We were, we were tiny, tiny participants in that. I, I'm glad you, Denise, called us ordinary rather than normal people. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but we were very ordinary people who made small contributions. The, the people who were there, the people to whose houses we went and with whom we spoke and who lived there day after day and year after year, we were just, we were just sort of the grease in, 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 in the machine, only that's too cold an analogy, but it really did result in something very specific and we were part of a huge movement. My experience was perhaps a little bit different because there was a direct, uh, my purpose, which I really wasn't aware of when I first went to Mississippi for the, for the training, uh, was actually to create the, the public outcry that, that, that really escalated the movement into uh, injunctions, legislation, uh, judicial action, legislative action. And so while I was in Selma, there were uh, uh, there was a very intentionality to every, almost everything we did. Um, but uh, while I was there, two injunctions were, were, were handed down that, interf that, that uh, curbed the behavior or made more visible the behavior of Sheriff Jim Clark and, uh, um, you know, the, the dogs and the herding of children into penned yards, to, uh, uh, arresting them, and so on, all sorts of outrages. So that there was a, I had a sense anyway of a more direct relationship between what we were doing day by day and the, the, uh, the, the, the momentum and the gathering of, of uh, public outcry, which was really the, well, Mahanda, Mahanda, Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, that was the, that was the goal uh, to, um, to, to, to out it. To, yeah, uh, and I didn't know that going in. Um, I, I thought I, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, so, and I think that um, it is important to give to recognize that movement, um, like like Paul said. Um, you know, sociologists when they study this, and my colleague Mark Dixon is here who studies social movements, um, that. And it, it was clear in all of your stories, right? You, you got into it through, your, through an organization or a social network contact or, um, and, and you went to a place that was already built up. You know, the fact that you all had the nonviolent training. You know, Diane Nash, when she was here, and I'm pointing to Richard Crocker, who the Tucker Foundation brought her last year, talked about 
the building of the, the infrastructure to provide that training to, to um, the black students who came together, to the white students who came down, the regular people who came together. And so it's the individual who can make a contribution, but it is when they're collected, when they are uh, coordinated um, through this activity that I think is, is the, comes through in each of your stories. Well, there was a continuum here that I think we weren't aware of because like Roger, I had no idea what I was getting into. I did not intend to go somewhere to be kicked and beaten. That was not my plan, but like Roger, it became obvious to me that that was the plan of the people who were organizing. This was intended to be part, if you went back a little more than a year, see, and nobody remembers this. We were talking about, this is as, you know, you're, you're talking to the 1960s, this is as remote to you students as World War I or the Hundred Years War or to us. I mean, it's so far back. Uh, you, you cannot now, as you sit here and as you lead your daily lives, envision how different the world was in every possible way. And one of the things was that issues about race and gender, issues about fairness and rights were, well, that's their problem there. You know, we weren't, we were sort of indifferent to that. It was accepted that things could be different in different places. And then there were a series of events, largely, I think, either sometimes orchestrated, sometimes just taken advantage of by organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, to organize, to create a momentum. And that momentum was part of a continuum. And what I mean by that is what struck me is the year before, barely a year before, there was Birmingham Sunday, which seems to be little remembered, but it was the bombing of a church in which four little girls were murdered. And it's a pop, think of this. Imagine if the church down your street was blown up and four local, you know, girls are dead. And then they was the... blue eyes. Yeah, that's right. Well, that... Yeah. Medgar Evers, who was in many ways, I think, the most powerful and, and down on the ground, courageous civil rights leader at that point in time, including Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers was shot down and murdered on the street. Um, in Mississippi, in this little town where, where several of us were, three civil rights workers, just like us, were dragged out one night into a police car and taken out and brutally murdered, brutally murdered, because they were just there to do what we were doing. And after this came Selma. And in the course of all this was this voter registration stuff. Well, I'll tell you how many voters I registered, zero. And all the time I was there, not one, because there was terror and a mounting terror. They, people were afraid. They weren't going to be, you know, they, they were polite enough to talk to me, but they sure as hell weren't going to go try to vote because they'd be dead too. When they were digging up the bodies of Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney, they found the bodies of eight other people as well who had spoken up about something, who they didn't even know the, who they were. And that continuum meant that there came a point where you couldn't be indifferent anymore. You couldn't say, well, that's Mississippi's issue or that's... New Hampshire's issue, that's not my issue. There came a point where you either accepted it or you rejected it. And we rejected it. You know, maybe you can't change what's in people's hearts, but you can change the way government has to deal with people. And that's probably what this accomplished, is that government had to, could no longer oppress on any level, federal or state. It had to allow these rights to be exercised. Um, and I think that was, you know, I've read that this had no impact on history. It had a huge impact on the individuals involved and none on history. I don't buy that at all. This was all part of a tremendous movement, a great sort of surge of momentum that we always have. And sometimes you're lucky to be in a generation that gets to catch it, and maybe sometimes you aren't. But America always has this momentum. I hadn't thought of this before just now, but I'm really grateful for the, the people who became a part of the, you know, the, the, the Freedom Rides and all of the movement up until that point, because when I entered it, uh, the conversation had been long going uh, and the work had been done and um, it was much easier for people because of the visibility, because of the press, because of all of that work that was done, it was very, it felt safer, it felt, People felt 
more able to take the risk because the witness was so strong and so visible. Uh, there was still a lot of outrageous things uh, happening and beatings taking place, but it was so much easier for people to stand up together. Uh, uh, on any given day, uh, the teachers of the elementary schools of Selma, Alabama would, would meet at Brown's Chapel Church and walk through the town, through the, 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 the black community and down to the, the county courthouse. Uh, and uh, one particular day, about five or 600 elementary students joined them. Uh, 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 AP, UPI, uh, don't exist anymore. Uh, uh, the, the media were constantly around from the very beginning of the march to the very end of the march. And the arrest took place. The children were herded a mile out of town by horseback by the sheriffs. That was all recorded. It made it not only more necessary, but easier the next time to stand up. Uh, and incrementally uh, became, uh, it, that to me was what it meant by movement. <laughs> Just, it, it grew. Uh, and I hadn't really thought of that uh, yeah. uh, before. But uh, th there's a great legacy that I experienced when I entered it. Uh, yeah, that that's that right. you did too. There was yeah. a system. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, it was it, it started with the with the sit-ins at the Woolworth Five and Dime. Let's talk about something that's not here anymore in Greensboro, North Carolina. Yeah. Um, the students from the local college uh, sat there at the whites-only uh, counter, and, and were I'm, I'm sorry, and, and were and were refused service, um, and they were told to leave, which they didn't, so they were arrested. And the next day, either they, if they'd gotten out on bail, or some others came. And they came again, and again, and again. If you see other people doing courageous things, Join them. you can say to yourself, maybe I could generate the courage to do that. You then had the people who rode in the buses, the interstate buses, from Washington, D.C., or the uh, or New York City or wherever, to wherever the bus was going in the South. The Freedom Riders. And they were called the Freedom Riders. And they were stopped on the road, and the, they were taken off the buses. Um, and they were arrested. Why? Because they were violating a law. An interstate commerce law um, did not protect them, but the laws of Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia or whatever did say that, the, uh, that you had to ride in the back of the bus or you couldn't ride on a whites-only bus. I'm not altogether sure what it was. It's an extraordinary thing to think now that those laws actually existed and that worse, worse people were arrested for that and they were taken away. But what's so exciting was that the next day or the next week there were more of them. Mm -hmm. And they got on different buses and they rode differently. Well, for somebody like me, I, I, I didn't necessarily have the courage to be in the first wave or maybe even the second wave, but by the time 64 came around and the opportunity presented itself here, I took it. And, and maybe it was naive of me to, to think that, well, it, it'll work out, nothing's really gonna happen. As it turned out, nothing personal really did happen. I didn't get beaten, I wasn't arrested, but, but it certainly informed my my, my mind about this, and, I, and I, I, I guess I've never really thought in terms of the larger movement. I, I, I understand it intellectually, but, but for the personal impact that it had on me was what I took away with, it, with me and, and, and carried it. I'm not unaware that it was a larger sense, and I, I think I tried to live that life, but, the, but thinking of it from, a, from a, an on high um, level, I've, I've not really thought of of being part of a, a, being a cog in a machine so much as I was a, 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 a cog on an ocean. Uh, so just a little bounding cog on, the, on, on tossing waters. And, and so I think you've, you've, you guys have given me a, a good deal to think about, and I appreciate that. <laughs> I really did feel that we were part of a movement, that, that it was like being floatsam on the ocean and the tides coming in. And boy, I thought that we'd be in a brand new society by the end of the 60s. Being the optimist that I am, I still think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Let me um, give the audience a chance to, or people here, to ask questions um, or make comments. We have a few mics, and we're going to ask if you wait for a moment till it gets to you. And um, 
just a few reminders to, you know, ask a question and not make a statement. And uh, we have a question right here. And there's another one up here. For I guess the first thing that I would like to do is give you the welcome that you should have received when you crossed the border. I was born in 1959 in Alabama. So I was a young child when you were there. So I'll give you my welcome. First of all, welcome gentlemen to our beautiful states of Alabama and Mississippi. We are honored that you have chosen to join us. And we do hope that you enjoy your work here. <laughs> you didn't get that welcome, but you have it now. <laughs> Um, and second, my name is Evelyn Ellis. I'm a vice president here at Dartmouth College. So I guess I would like to ask you, given where I grew up, grew up, grew up and where I am now, I guess my question is, do you feel as though your work had direct impact? On our own lives or on others? On the lives of people like me who were there when you were there. Well, I will try to answer that a little bit. I actually got to go again to Mississippi once again in 1967, and I made several friends who were part of the Great Migration who went to Boston. Um, and in part, they went because some of us were there, and we changed the level of the horizon. We, sh we talked about other kinds of possibilities. And that, that was personally very moving. It was hard for me to, it's hard for me to sense that I had an impact on, on, any, on, on, on anyone there other than the, that very uh, tight uh, a group uh, with whom I lived and worked. Uh, tight primarily in large measure because of the, the being surrounded by fear and a sense of the terror, the, the dread uh, of having no control whatsoever. Uh, um, and I remember one experience was actually the last remarkable experience I had right before I left of meeting with a, a, a white student at the high school in Selma. Uh, and. Uh, our, my hope of having a conversation with him, which was a conversation, and uh, actually what it turned out to be a, a setup in which I was held at gunpoint and beaten by two uh, men. Uh, so I never had that opportunity to do it. Uh, I think the only people I may have affected directly were people uh, with whom I communicated after I returned. When I actually began to uh, sort of integrate what my experience had been because it was just very uh, uh, otherworldly for me. Not, I had no frame of reference within which to understand. Uh, and so I had to sort of piece it together. But I think that since then, uh, that's really formed my, the core of what message I have had in the role I've had as a family therapist or, or a pastor. Uh, um, but not then. No. It was a movement then. I knew that I was there not to convince anybody of anything, but to be on Huntley Brinkley, <laughs> being thrown into jail or, or, or whatever. I don't know that this answers your question, but what I know is that, you know, like Roger, I eventually was arrested and you're held at gunpoint and you're pretty sure these guys are going to kill you because that's what they say they're going to do and nobody knows where you are, and they beat you up badly, broken nose, you know, blood everywhere. And then they drag you out and say, get in this patrol car, you know, we're gonna take you across the state line. And of course, we've been told not to do that. And when they took me out, there were, you know, police lights flashing out of the courthouse jail in, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and it's quite a big crowd of people. I was surprised, and it was dark, and I was panicked and I was not going to get in that cop car. And for these black kids that I knew a little bit, because I had met them, um, it wasn't SNCC or anybody else. These four kids in front of 
the sheriff and the deputy sheriff and these highway patrolmen and a very angry crowd of Klan members grabbed me and took me to their car instead of the patrol car. And uh, so that was way different than when I'd first gotten there. And people were afraid to even really talk very much. And these kids knew that they were, everybody recognized who they were, and they stood up. And so, I don't know, I sort of felt huge regret that I left because I never knew what happened to them. I didn't feel very good about myself for a long time that I should never have left. But I, the truth is I had to go, and they're the ones that got me out. And I think that they had the courage to do that. Um, maybe that partly came from me being there. In the Peace Corps, when you were being recruited, one of the things they said was that you will be sent somewhere and you will work on a project. You'll, you'll uh, help to build a well so that a, a, a village can have water or, or um, perhaps lay sewer pipes so that you can have sanitation. That was a project, and it was a, a finite project. You would go for a year or two. You would have something at the end of it that would, be, would exist because there was such a large infrastructure behind it. The USAID department, whatever it was, would have built something. We didn't have that, or at least I didn't have it. So there was nothing left from my two weeks that I could point to and say, I did that. I was part of that. We, we made something happen. So I, I don't see that I had that kind of impact. The, the impact I had was the second part of the recruitment for the Peace Corps, which is to say, you will get more out of it than you give. And that's what happened to me. So that I came back a very different person. A lot more confident, frankly, that I could make a contribution than, than when I left. But also believing that it was, <coughs> that I was able to do that. It wouldn't just be theoretical, I would, I would be, thanks frankly to the kind of education I was going to get here, but also because it was going to be, I was going to be, it was going to be available to me if I, if I learned things and, and, and then went on and applied them in whatever area I was going to, to be in, uh, I, would, I would have the ability to make that, that contribution. And, and, and so I think that's what it was the approach. No, I don't think I was a great contributor in Philadelphia, Mississippi, but I think I was a good, great contributor to me and to the, to the world that I wound up inhabiting for the next 40 years. Don't you think that always happens when people are involved with other people to do something that's important? And sure, but who knew at the time? Correct? That's the, the problem with it is you've got to take that first step. And until you take the first step, until you make the commitment, until you take the chance, you're never going to know that. You'll never realize it. You may be something you'll read about, somebody will tell you about, but it's not in your guts until you do it. Right, right. We have another question here. Um, it's, it's very moving to hear all of you speak, and, and I have just all kinds of questions about the present, but um, <laughs> I think that the, I, I'm a little embarrassed to ask this, and you can feel free to say no. I didn't. I, I confused with the names, the gentleman on the left, because I wasn't sure where you were starting. You had referred to um, a monster. And um, if you would not mind telling us that story, I would be very interested in hearing it and hearing people's reactions to that. You can tell, show you a picture of him. Thank you. Um, between the time that I left campus and the time I got on the bus to Mississippi, I encountered something that some of you may recognized. It, was an, it has been, become an iconic photograph on the cover of Life magazine. And it's the picture of, of uh, uh, Sheriff Price and the deputies at the arraignment for their murder of Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney. Hold it up so the camera can see it. And the uh, photograph shows incredible arrogance, disdain, <laughs> mockery, and uh, this is the monster. I'm not talking about Sheriff Price, necessarily, but uh, I know that this was in my mind when I went down, and uh, you have mentioned the stories that you heard. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the woman who was murdered in, uh, across the river uh, in uh, Mississippi 
while I was in Selma, uh, but uh, the stories were uh, uh, about the monster, so to speak, the dread that came from uh, the awareness that we all had that there was absolutely no control that we had of our own lives. Somebody else could take it away, any of it, all of it, uh, very easily. Um, uh, bore themselves out constantly in the in the in the in the in the affect and the and the and the language, and the posture, and the actions of and people from uh, Sheriff uh, Jim Clark and the posse in Selma, Alabama, to Bull Connor in in, in Birmingham. It was all very real, and uh, uh, to me, the monster was uh, not just. The, the person, but the but, but the system, yes. and I, you know, a therapist, a family system, system that encouraged and and, and authorized and made uh, laudable that kind of way of relating to self and culture and, and world. That to me is the monster, the evil, uh, you know, the, the 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 system that doesn't hear, doesn't process information from the outside, doesn't reflect. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, I mean, and, right. And, and I think that one of the things that I felt purposeful about with, uh, and, and quite excited about in the midst of a lot of confusion after I left, uh, uh, because I too felt very guilty, I left because I could and I felt like shit, excuse me, uh, and, and I can still get there in my own thinking, uh, but uh, it was uh, 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 the notion of of both confronting and helping uh, people identify the monster, <laughs> so to speak. That was the issue. It wasn't this person or that person, per se. See, here's the thing. Uh, These are all just absolutely... Okay, you got me right to the front of my seat. <laughs> yeah, but it's a very, it does really, it's a very powerful thing to think about and to have participated in. Um, this, the deputy sheriff that I that he showed you a picture of old Cecil Price is this little uh, kind of round-faced pudgy guy with uh, you know a balding former milkman who got elected to be the deputy sheriff first time I met him he was this real smiley joke-telling kind of character had these jokes about rabbits and these rabbits that were coming down here from up north you know and the, the fox was going to get him they better be careful and he would laugh and he was a very kind of ordinary sort of person and uh, but in him was this, there was a monster. The monster was the hatred and the anger and the unbelievable theory that the threat of change could unleash in these people. There was a monster there, and it was in this little guy, Cecil Price, the deputy sheriff, who was one of the people that brutally murdered three, three civil rights workers. And he's the guy that arrested me and scared the hell out of me, I'll tell you what. Um, and to see this, you know, I remember one day, and I'm walking around, and this white lady in a house says, son, come up, it's hot. It's a hot day, come up here and have some sweet tea. And she wanted me to sit on the porch, and I did. And she said, son, does your mom know, do your mama know that you're down here? You know, you shouldn't be down here. What if we came to your town and told you how you should run things? This isn't right. This isn't right. And you know, you need to, you need to go home. Because your mom is worried about you. And uh, if you stay too long, there are people here that won't let you leave. It's time for you to go home. And, uh, you know, she said it in a sweet way, but I started to feel afraid when this grandmother was threatening me. <laughs> like that's what she was doing. And then it started to build, you know. Um, and that was the monster that very ordinary people, people that you could like and identify with, I say, I. My family came from farming communities, and I, they looked just like these guys. I mean, really. And just these ordinary people, your other Americans, could have in their heart the hate that would want to make them kill you because you were challenging something that was so fundamental. And that, you know, that momentum that allowed that, to, that hate to be revealed and then reviled and rejected is so important. It's such a, a pivotal part of our recent history. And I'm so honored to sit with three, these three guys. 
I think it was fear, too. They were afraid. That was an oh, incredible yeah. fear. Yeah. Everybody was afraid. Um, and it had a lot to do with fear of the other. Yeah. That's I it, think. isn't it? We objectified um, one another very easily. I think I shared this with somebody yesterday that uh, for a while, and, and I got left back here at Dartmouth and had to go for an extra summer. And one of the things I did was to drive a laundry truck delivering shirts here and there. And I went to a very wealthy house in Vermont and kept doing that week after week. And then finally somebody was there. And he said, you can never come back here again. I said, why? He said, because you have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, wait, you know, this, this, is a real, this, is a, this is all about being the other. He had an idea of, of that. When, my, when I was 12, my father sat me down after I went out on a date with the daughter of, his, of, their, of my parents' friends. and said, you know, you can't marry this girl. I said, yeah, I'm 12. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you have another reason. Said, She's Catholic. It's a fear of the other. And that there was a system so entrenched in place. In fact, it was in law because of the Jim Crow laws. That that was a system that made the other for white people of black people, and what we were challenging, and and especially what the people who lived there were challenging, was that sense of otherness. And then this movement, this movement began to grow, and we began to see that there were other others, women. Yeah. In 1965, the slogan was, "Women should say yes to the men who say no." People who, the men who were resisting the draft. And then by 1970, we people were going, well, maybe that doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> and then there was another other. They were gay. And the guy actually who organized us to go down to Mississippi and Alabama, the, George Kopflesh of the DCU, was an, was an early out gay person, which was truly amazing on his part. Then there was another other, and that's people with disabilities. And then there was another other, and those are the uh, Islamists, and, and there will, unfortunately, always be others. And I think one of the things that we stood for in those days, and probably all of us Still continue do. to stand for, is to see an umbrella that includes everybody. And I think that if any of you know anything about the history of folk singing, Pete Seeger, that's, that's what his life has been all about. Well, and I think, um, as the, uh, the last pr question was too, I think you all wanted to talk about some of the implications for today, now, where we are. I mean, I think one of the most important things is hearing from you about this history. It's real, it matters for us to know. Um, I'm all choked up, I'm sorry. Um, but, but now also, so not that we can just learn and remember, but what, what does it mean for us today? Where do you see the implications now? We, you know, we'd like to think, well, that's done. We, we've moved on. And then it's not. It's never done. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm yeah, just going to jump, jump in. in. Jump. <laughs> it's, it's never done, and, and it will, we will always be struggling to make the world a better place for more people. But the other is now just the 1%. And, and I think the manifestation of our movement is, is clearly at Zuccotti Park in, in New York City, where I'm from. And, um, and the, the whole Occupy movement, it's really going to be interesting to see how that develops and where it goes. But now, 99% of the people are included in, under the umbrella, supposedly. Supposedly. And one of the interesting things about Zuccotti Park is that the police, the local police precinct was dumping in the park crazy people. And literally, I mean, I'm using the term clinically, I suppose, um, to try to be disruptive, to try to create problems for the people in Zuccotti Park. And what, they, what the people in Zuccotti Park did was, some of us are psychologists, some of us are social workers. Let's deal with this. Yes, an opportunity. So I, I do see that all of this is a, is a, a the anti-war movement and, and everything are part of this uh, movement to get, to get <coughs> rid of the notion of the other. I want to, I'm going to revise my answer to your question. There were, there were about six people that I was, and this was the great, one of the greatest surprises that has also sort of informed an awful lot of who I am and what I have done since then. Um, the first time I was thrown in jail, I was uh, arrested as a white and thrown into 
the Dallas County jail cells uh, with seven white prisoners. Now, I had in my mind, uh, and, and by the way, I was pitched in, uh, thrown in, and said, here's one of uh, Martin Luther King's nigger lovers, and thrown in to the cell. And, you know, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was a preppy, dark, you know, no frame of mind. Uh, scared to death. That cleaned that up some. And uh, um, there was a litany. I was encountered by a litany of, I'm in for manslaughter. I'm in for carnal knowledge of a minor. I'm, and, and, and my <laughs> sense of, of dread grew just, and I was shaking. I was scared to death. And what happened then was uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, every single one of them began to turn to me and relate to me in a way that was empathetic because they assumed that I hated the same system that had treated them in the way that they felt was unfair. And, and it was all centered around Sheriff Jim Clark and the posse. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, they taught me how to roll cigarettes with newspapers. They told me how to light, uh, uh, heat coffee in a toilet by, <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, <laughs> by what? <laughs> roll toilet paper. I'm, I'm amazing. <laughs> I can do it today. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I sensed a, 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 an intimacy, a battery, <coughs> or whatever. I was just absolutely overwhelmed by it. And so what happened to me was, the incredible, and it relates to all of this. It, 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 uh, it the incredible power uh, and uh, dynamic element to life, for good, for whatever we're talking about here, that comes just from listening, listening to the other, maybe, or to the one. It doesn't matter, but but that's always been sort of what opened the door for the next step for me, whether it was a system that I was listening to or. A, a church in trouble, or or a family in trouble, or <laughs> a child in trouble, or whatever, uh, or not in trouble, but delighting, and then that illuminated the next step. But it was always from listening, and it was an incredible surprise to that. Uh, and it eliminates the the other. <laughs> it is the responsibility of the society when you come back into it, at least in my view that you want to be part of the society that's taking a hold of the whole society and shaking it by the scruff of the neck and saying we can do better. And that we have to do better. And that, that you can push a social system to retrain itself, to better itself. And, and, and what, what I've done and, and where I've taken this is, is going into government, into elected office to say that we're not going to, in, in, in politics, uh, to, to, to elect gay men and women to public office. Not a big deal anymore, but it was 10 years ago when, when we got started in, in my community. Uh, to stand up against the other politicians who are um, demonizing Hispanic immigrants is a means of getting elected to office. To stand against those, those predominantly men, but by no means exclusively so. Um, in each instance where you have the opportunity to go out and, and stand or to, to oppose, and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but to, to have that role and to take that role self-consciously for expanding the circle of those people who are under the umbrella, um, so that you can, when you are done with it, say, this is where I made a difference, this is how um, in, in the little, in the county in which I live, or the community in which I live, you built something that uh, everyone will take for granted from here on out. Nobody will care, nobody will remember because it now just seems like it's a perfectly reasonable part of the fabric. But if you're hearing our stories, you're hearing where the circle was really quite small and how it's been expanded and can be expanded further. Now there probably will be fewer and fewer vast opportunities such as perhaps we could see that we had. But there will always be the opportunities and you have to take them. And if you don't, that's the part that you'll regret uh, when you reach our age. And even if you think it's not making a difference, you get to be with the best people. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
In terms of, oh, sorry. In terms of, Ted, just a very quick statement, and that is that, that and, and this was a statement that came from a seminary professor of, uh, of my wife Sandy's uh, as a response to a question of hers about, okay, what do I do? What, what do I do? What, what do I do with this stuff that's in me? Uh, and her, the, uh, um, her um, advice, her word was, uh, try to figure out and keep, a, keep in mind where your bliss meets the world's need. Where, where, where are you, where, what, do you, what do you love? That to me was a, so powerful a message from Martin Luther King. He was aware of anger. He knew what anger was. But he never, ever lost sight of what it was that he loved. And he was very clear about that. And he understood then the things that interfered with it, that diminished it, that broke it, that, that ruptured it, that betrayed it. And that's where he, that's where he, he pushed. That's where he touched. That's where he, he lived. Sorry, go ahead. No, your, uh, your additions are very helpful. I admire all four of you for willing to go to Mississippi in uh, 1964. Uh, the year after that, uh, I was involved in the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, uh, program, uh, and uh, SNCC had Mississippi, Mississippi and the SCLC pretty much had you know, Virginia through, uh, through Alabama, and I was very happy that I went to Virginia <laughs> and not, and not, and not, uh, uh, not to uh, not to Mississippi or, or Alabama, uh, and uh, we. Uh, I was at, uh, just very briefly. I was at Sur uh, Surrey County, directly across the river from uh, Williamsburg, and two thirds black, but the economic issues were not severe. There was pl plenty of work there, and it was hard to get people. Uh, you know, really, really, uh, really interested. So it was a different challenge, a chal a differentness which I appreciated <laughs> at the time, uh, not not being down uh, where, where, the, where the action really was. My question was even uh, going further back. Uh, since I'm a little older than you are, I was, uh, 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 but not not too much. Uh, uh, I remember uh, reading in the summer uh, this, uh, the the fact of uh, Emmett Till. Being uh, being uh, uh, taken out and murdered in 1955, and uh, as a youngster living in New Hampshire, not having much uh, contact with uh, things, this 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 uh, this stuck with me because Emmett Till was the same age I was, and uh, then of course that was one year after Brown versus Board of Education, uh, and then uh, of course come 1960 the uh, sit-ins at uh, Woolworth. I have one small little vignette on that. I was down at a uh, mock democratic convention in Cambridge, and there was a Woolworths in Harvard Square then, at that time, uh, no more. And there were uh, counter pickets, this was in May, uh, there were counter pickets there uh, say, uh, saying, you know, a serve, uh, a serve black state, which, which I said to myself, this is very nice, but you're not in Greensboro, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, but uh, just, I just, the, the whole black white existence in the South. Uh, goes back from before the um, you know, before the Mayflower. Leroy Bennett's uh, uh, journalistic account of the uh, black. And I, I just I, I didn't I didn't hear you you all having a sense of how far back these really uh, the really real horrors uh, went. Uh, maybe you were kind of young, and I was pretty young at the time too. I just didn't uh, I didn't know if you had a, had a sense of the long term. Uh, Social uh, structure that had been, uh, that had been in place for over 300 years, and and, uh, and or or if you, if you did know that, maybe you wouldn't have gone. Do you have any any comments on that? No. Uh, I I was uh, personally I I uh, have a have a sense of history, but what I don't have is a, is a personal sense of history. That um, as as we said earlier. Um, the, the World War I is as far back from us in the 60s as what we're talking about now is to most students here in Dartmouth um, today. We have a visceral sense of that past. Our grandparents had a visceral sense of, of, of World War I. Lord knows I have no sense at all of what it was like in Virginia in the 1980s because I wasn't there. I only know what I knew. And, and that's, 
I mean, part of it is that that's the purpose of education, is to, is, to, is to widen our horizons. But absent that, you just basically know what you know. And, and uh, the, the thought is, act on where you are. Do what you can do now. And the rest of it will either come or it won't. But to make a career of trying to know everything and, and not act, uh, I, I would, would say that would be a very unwise way to uh, live your life. I, I grew up in a bubble, uh, a horse farm in, in, in a country in New Jersey, uh, and my source of human warmth for the first five years of my life was a black woman and her husband named Wissy, who was my nanny, and it'll give you an idea of the picture back there. Uh, and I can remember a conversation with her husband Joe when I was about 10 or 11, in which I discovered a, uh, in, in a chest in their apartment, uh, a, 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 an army uniform and a bayonet, which was fascinating to me at the time. And I asked Joe to tell me about it, and his wife and, and Wissy, Melissa, said, uh, uh, I, I don't think Joe can talk about that. Well, about a year later, he did talk about it, and it was his painful experience in the Korean War, uh, in, 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 in part of which was his sense of of isolation and a sense of loneliness and a sense of being cannon fodder, so to speak. Uh, that was really the only sense I had at all other than in history books. And uh, we did read uh, a lot uh, that was not necessarily the, the party line in terms of history in those days, at least the school I went to. Uh, so I had, a, I had some sense of the context in which his, th their lives were. Uh, and that was back in the late 40s and early 50s. Uh, and, but that was all, uh, no uh, sense of it at all. I had a sense of, ironically, what, what has become very popular now through the, the publishing of the and, the, and the, and the distribution of the movie, The Help. Uh, I, I was aware of that culture uh, um, from a critical point of view, from my family. Uh, and conversations around the dinner table and, 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 and things of that sort, which had nothing to do with what we experienced in this little bucolic farm in New Jersey. Uh, but, but, and I think that probably played a, ro a, you know, a role uh, in, my, in my experience. Dirk? To react to that question or or to the implications, I think, in some ways. Yeah, I don't know. You know. I'm not sure about the I don't know what... Uh, I came away understanding that life is full of contradictions. Um, you know, on the one hand, you... Uh, nobody's got the right... Nobody has all of the right answers. Nobody knows everything. Not, no one person is right about everything. You have to listen. Even people that you are that you dislike or you're afraid of or, you know, either you have to listen to them. You better understand where the other side is coming from. You learn that as a lawyer. I learned it first in Mississippi. Um, you know, you just better be careful about being sh too sure of anything. God protect us from true believers is my, where I come out, frankly. Um, but on the other hand, there are some things that are so fundamental some things that are so important that you just can't be objective, I think. There are, you know, there you come to points in your life where there's stuff that is so significant to you that seems so wrong that you let yourself down by not spe at least speaking out against it. You cannot, certainly in this country, with everything we have to be thankful for, and I don't mean to sound like I'm running for Congress, but I mean, you know, with everything we have, you cannot be indifferent to people in this country, to Americans that don't, aren't offered the same opportunities, you know? So there is the contradiction that don't be too sure of what you think, and yet you need to be sure of what you think. I don't know how to resolve any of that, and I've never really sorted it out, um, and I don't talk, I've never talked to anybody, really, as much as I've talked to you today about this. Um, you know, when I came back from this, 
Um, my mother never said a word to me about it, ever, <laughs> her whole life. And uh, my dad spoke to me about it once. And I can see I'm getting choked up even telling you this story. <laughs> he was lived to be 93, and when he was 92 years old, we were talking about something else, and he said, uh, just out of the blue, <laughs> hmm. he said, uh, you remember that time you went down south? I said, yeah. He said, your mother was worried sick. She was more worried about you then when you were in the Army. And we're so glad that you came back. And he said, we're really proud of you. And we are. I'm going to take my, although now I'm all choked up, um, opportunity to, um, you know, there, there are a number of really important themes. I think indifference is not tolerable. Bearing witness is important. Acting through all kinds of ways, sometimes speaking, sometimes direct action um, is important for all of us to do in the ways that we can and to be aware of that. How can you make that difference? Um, but you heard all of that too. And so the most important thing I would like us to do is thank these four gentlemen.